after what's your name, this is perhaps the most frequently asked question when trying to get to know someone. From ancient times onward, where one comes from has helped define and distinguish identity. And where you're from has often been equated with who you are, or at least a key factor in determining it. For some, where you come from is a matter of pride. How many of you here today are native Southerners? Raise your hand proudly. How many of you are transplants? <laughs> Don't be ashamed. <laughs> As a transplant from the Midwest, I can tell you that it has been my experience that where you are from is even more important in the South than other places. The first time I moved to South Carolina 30 years ago, I was living in Columbia and working as a chaplain resident at the hospital there in Columbia. And one day I went into a room to visit this lady, a beautiful lady, probably in her 70s or so. And in the course of our conversation, she says to me, tell me, son, where are you from? And I said, well, ma'am, I'm from Indiana. And she said, oh, a Yankee. <laughs> she said, you know, I've never quite gotten over the Civil War. <laughs> said Sherman came through and we would burn down all of Columbia. And I said, well, I am so sorry. <laughs> I found this story uh, a while back on the internet that said there was a man in Topeka, Kansas who decided to write a book about churches around the country. And so he started by flying to San Francisco and then working his way east from there. Uh, he went to every large church uh, that he could come across and began taking pictures. And so he spotted a golden telephone on a wall and it intrigued him and the sign under the phone read $10,000 a minute. Well, seeking out the pastor, he asked about the phone and the sign and the pastor answered that this golden phone was in fact a direct line to heaven and if he paid the price, he could talk directly to God. Well, the man thanked the pastor and he continued on his way. And as he continued, he visited churches in Seattle and Boise and Denver and Minneapolis and Chicago and Milwaukee and, and New York and on around the United States. And he found more and more phones with that very same sign and the same answer from each pastor. But finally, he arrived in the South. And upon entering a church, lo and behold, he sees the usual golden telephone. But this time, the sign reads, calls 25 cents. Well, fascinated, he talked to the pastor. He asked the pastor, he said, Reverend, I, I've been in cities all across the country, and in each church I found this golden telephone, and I've been told that it's a direct line to heaven and that I could talk to God. But, but in other churches, the cost was $10,000 a minute, but your sign reads 25 cents a call, and I, and I was wondering why. And, and the pastor, smiling benignly, replied, Well, son, you're in the South now. It's a local. <laughs> a lot of folks take pride in where they're from. So this morning our scripture comes from the book of Revelation, perhaps one of the most read, most fascinating, but most misunderstood pieces of literature in all of Holy Scripture. We know that this book was written by the Apostle John as he was held captive on the prison, as a prisoner on the island of Patmos. And he records for us a vision that he received with all of its intricate and sometimes confusing imagery. But it had brought such hope and strength to John in his time of tribulation. And it has continued throughout the centuries to bring the same to God's people in tribulation wherever we may be. The Revelation is in actuality, I don't know if you know this, but it was written in the form of a drama. And like all good theatrical creations, its purpose was to cause us to think. Think about our future, even as we reflect upon our past and seek to live present in the, 
see fully in the present. The mistake I think often made in the interpretation of the revelation is that we think it's more like a crystal ball when in reality it is more like a mirror. While at the heart of the message of Revelation is this profound truth that we also desperately need to hear that we do have a future. The sky may seem to be falling around us, but with God, we always have a future. But also found within that vision is an equally vital truth that in our present, in our today, we are not alone. In the portion of the vision read this morning so beautifully, Thank you, Thank you, Sheila. We find people who are in tribulation. Do you know that word? No. Have you ever been in tribulation? No. Well, yes, of course. That's one of those stupid rhetorical preacher questions. <laughs> now, our tribulations may have very different titles, and some may even be too painful to name or describe. But unless we've lived in a coma, we likely, at some point in our lives, have known trouble and heartache and grief and loss and disappointment and frustration and fear and despair. Now we may not have lived as a prisoner on an island, but other life circumstances may at times have put us in our own very kind of prison. We may not have been tortured for the convictions we hold, but perhaps we have known the exclusion of being on the other side of popular we may not have wrestled with real life beasts, but perhaps we have faced down some monsters of life, and we were certain they were going to take us out. Yes, tribulation is not a concept that is exclusive to the end of world history. Tribulation has been real in the lives of God's children throughout the ages. And the elder in the vision read for us, voices one of those stupid rhetorical preacher questions about who are these people in tribulation and where do they come from? Well, the answer is they come from every tribe and from every nation and from every race and from every gender, every ethnic group, every sexual orientation, every economic class, every neighborhood, every religion, those who, are, who have experienced tribulation. They are Southerners and Northerners, and from the East and from the West, they are European and South American and African and Asian and North American and Australian and I guess Arctic, the Arctic and Africa. There's anybody there? Those who have come through tribulation are from every age, from the first century and the 21st century, in all ages. They are us, right? And we are them. And we are all in this together, as Ann Med reminds us. <laughs> you see, the prejudices which keep us apart really are pretty ridiculous when you think about them. For what does it matter, the color of your skin? Amen. When your loved one is dying, it still hurts. <clears throat> what does it matter if your political views are liberal or conservative or somewhere in between? If, what does it matter if your life possessions can be found in numerous investment accounts or in the change you hold in your pocket. If cancer is the diagnosis, it's still scary. What does it matter? If you are a single parent living in government assisted housing, or you're a traditional nuclear family out in a well manicured suburb, if it's your teenager who has a drug problem, you still feel hopeless. Amen. What does it matter? If you are six years old or 96 years old, when you travel through times of tribulation, you need somebody to be there. Amen. And so the vision we are given this morning is that it matters not where you come from. For when we come through tribulation, 
we are one family. Amen. And the good news is, we have a shepherd at the head who guides us and comforts us and loves us through that tribulation. Amen. And you see, this shepherd, he knows a little something about navigating through tribulation. For this shepherd is the lamb who was slain. The Savior who traveled a rocky path all the way to Golgotha's Hill. The Christ who was nailed to a cross. But you know what? Good news. He came through. It's an empty tomb. And the message of Revelation is that with that shepherd as our guide, we too will come through whatever tribulation we are facing or ever will face. And with brothers and sisters from every branch of the human family, we too can have the stains of our own stupidity washed clean and the scars of life's struggles healed. And we one day will stand before the throne in spotless robes. Amen. Is that not a beautiful picture? Amen. For the vision says that the lamb at the center of the throne is our shepherd. He will lead us to streams of life-giving water. And then it says, God will wipe all tears from our eyes. You see, this vision is not just something for the sweet by and by. It is a vision as much for our present as it is for our future. If we will open ourselves to the movement of God's Spirit. And we will risk joining the company of fellow travelers. And it is a little risky to join a company of fellow travelers because there's all kinds of people. And some of them, some of them do some pretty stupid stuff, just like we do. Amen. <coughs> if we'll risk joining the company of fellow travelers who have walked or are walking through tribulation, wherever they come from. So this morning, if you are walking through tribulation right now, there is a message for you in that book of Revelation. And it's twofold. Number one, you are not alone. Don't think you are alone. And number two, you will make it through. Amen. You will make it through. Maybe this morning, you are not in tribulation right now, praise God. <coughs> But you are a member of God's family. And if you are not in tribulation right now, but you're a part of God's family, here's the message for you in that book we just read from. You are not above tribulation. You're not above it. And number two, out of your time of strength, you can care for and minister to those who find themselves in time of weakness. And number three, God has no time or patience for our petty prejudices. Amen. For we are all in this thing what? Together. Yeah. Together. Let's pray. <laughs> Thank you for that beautiful picture that you have painted for us through the ancient words we now know as the revelation of John. For Father, through those words, we see a future, but we also find strength for the present. And so today, wherever we find ourselves, wherever we come from and wherever place we're in, tribulation, <coughs> We thank you for the hope we have been given. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So today we have the privilege of coming to his table. Uh, let me remind you, this is the Lord's table. Uh, it's not
not a South Main table. It's not a United Methodist table. It's God's table. Jesus set the table for us, and he invites all of his children to come. Uh, I once had someone, or probably more than once, but someone once said, I, don't, I can never take communion because I'm not worthy. Well, if that were the requirement, would none of us come up to this table? Right? It's not about being worthy. It's not about having your life all cleaned up. It's about acknowledging your need for God's grace. And that's what we find at this table. We find it. Thank you, God, for the gift of grace shown to us in the simple everyday of beautiful elements of bread and wine, or in our case, juice in the cup. It's a mystery. It's a mystery that you loved us so much that through your son, Jesus, you have redeemed us by his shed blood and his broken body. But it is also, in all of its mystery, most incredible gift ever shown to the world and to us. And so we humbly, graciously, lovingly accept it this day and give you thanks for